So just briefly review, and then we continue with the case of two atoms in the unit cell, still in one dimension, to make it simpler. So last time we derived the expression of energy in harmonic approximation. This is what we are using. You don't have to copy this, of course. <coughs> Plus the second derivative, which so the first one gives the force on the atom in equilibrium, which is zero. I and J over the lattice, alpha and beta over the three Cartesian coordinates. J in the direction alpha and beta. And this we called force constant, D I alpha J beta, or also we write the problem as alpha beta. Okay. Um, the force of an atom can be derived from the Newton law. Um, as the of all these coefficients I to J or we can also well we can let's call it J beta J alpha beta this is proper and we also derived the Either way can be written. I started with vectors and then I went to coordinates. And then we derived also the dynamical matrix by plugging into this expression uh, exact dependence on the space and time. This is U of R. P. each direction because we'll separate in three co components. What do we exactly mean by double line over the... This is the amplitude. I was writing that a, a single line okay. has inside uh, the k-dependence. Okay, okay, okay. So, just in that. Okay, so there are three components of this one. And then we derive, by plugging this inside, we derive the dynamical matrix. Um, but probably won't get the signs right. Um, beta. Oh, it's the opposite. And then you get this dependence. Yeah. Beta. And then we call this dynamical matrix. Is it correct? Uh, I think there was a minus here and minus here which were cancelling. And uh, yeah. So it is these coefficients which have the k dependence to plot the dispersion relation of the phonons. And then furthermore, we apply this in the case of 1D chain. You remember? Um, which gets very simplified because there is no alpha and beta anymore. And you get that the n omega squared is equal to v of r. Okay, this is a k dependence, yeah, it's k. Mm -hmm. That is no vector. And we got um, that the frequency, 
and the stood this year, no? Not four, it was two. Can you check? Two. Okay. Um, M sine square K A half. Well, if it's square, there is no. No, it's not square. It's sine because there is omega only. And then this goes like linear. And then we looked in the limit of k going to zero. We said that the wavelength is, uh, okay, is inversely determined by k, which means that here you have very long, long wavelengths. And the waves with macroscopic wavelengths are sound waves that you can see then you can see like plugging k0 in this formula that they all have the same amplitude in this limit. So they are moving as the center of mass, translational motion. The whole crystal vibrates together in phase. Um, so the sound is a collective vibration of the atoms in crystal. It's a collective phenomenon. And well, we will continue to today with the, with the normal different modes. And what else I wanted to say here? Yeah, we also emphasize that at the edges, the atoms move opposite. And we'll continue with that today. Um, so this is the way sound propagates through metals, through crystals. Um, how does the sound propagate through air? Collisions of molecules. Um, not colli well, not so much collisions. But what is the difference between air and the crystal? There is no this kind of crystal symmetry in air. There is no symmetry, of course, and there is no restoring force. Yeah. In the crystal, when you move an atom from its equilibrium position, there is a restoring force which pushes it down. This uh, square. There is no such thing. So actually in the air, the, the sound waves can propagate only like as an accumulation, like pressure of particles, like change of pressure. It can be in only one way. Today we will make a difference between two different types of motion. In crystal, well in more than 1D, it can move perpendicular to the propagation direction, it can move this way, and move along the direction in a 3D crystal. Well, in air, it can go only in the direction of propagation. If there is no questions on that, I will continue with uh, today's thing. <laughs> Much better. <coughs> so, yes. If we would like to, uh, how to say, uh, derive the wave properties or the wave properties in the air in the equation that we wrote, we have uh -huh. to get rid of the second derivative and leave on the first one because there is no equilibrium point. Is that the case? That's a guess. You have only kinetic energy. It's Mm. Yeah, let's leave it for okay. the end. I have stuff to derive. Also, I have a few questions, few answers from before. Oh. But let, let's finish this. Uh, um, two atoms. Um, in uh, I could have checked the title better. Um, in linear chain. Can you see when the light on the right? Kind of. Not. Yeah. I'm so happy that the <laughs> this thing <laughs> cleans better. Okay, let me. Uh, it's not space there either. It was a mistake then. <laughs> um, Should we 
something you see or not at all? We see it. We see a it. little bit only. Sorry, I was so happy as it cleans finally something that I can clean the blackboard. Maybe we can wave something at the blackboard and pull dry. Okay, I'll keep talking and then you copy as much as, as you see. Um, we imagine two atoms. Um, the atoms in principle should have two different masses. Um, however, I'll make it the same mass. Next time, if I have time, I will derive tomorrow, I will derive the case for different masses. Now I want to emphasize other things and don't want to introduce new things with, with the mass. So I'm putting the mass to be the same, but the springs, the force constants between them, the force constant between them is very strong and between the other such pairs it's much weaker. Much weaker. So this is something like you have pairs of atoms strongly bound together and then weakly bound to other pairs of atoms. And this is a good moment to mention a, a, a real-life situation of this type, and that is molecular crystals of solids. <coughs> um, maybe you know example of molecular crystals of solids? Um, no, it? no, it's molecular. No, molecular. The main idea is that you have a molecule or like a, a unit, but it's a molecule, which has strong bonds inside, electrostatic bonds, uh -huh. ionic, covalent, whatever. But then between the, these structures, between the molecules, the force is weak, the interaction is weak. Like here I drew a very weak, uh, thin, uh, very weak uh, spring constant. Sorry? Sugar. Uh, sugar itself is a molecule, which has that. But then if you put, like if you create a lollipop, you won't get a crystal, but you'll get some kind of solid, um, which is bound by, uh, by these weak uh, forces. Um, they are called Van der Waals forces. Maybe the closest example to this one is HCl, which is very strong bond between them. But ho however, they have they are bit charged, and then it will create a bond with the next such molecule. Cl is strongly, uh, it's uh, like a negative. and so on. This is a weak bond in between them. And this is dipole-dipole interaction. This is a one dipole, this is a second dipole. You know how dipoles interact? It's one of our R cubed. And we can get so one of these molecular, uh, one of the interactions in molecular crystals, a dipole-dipole interaction which is much weaker than Coulomb, than uh, dipole-dipole interaction. But then you don't have to have dipoles. Not all molecules have dipole moment. What happens, for example, with um, <coughs> CO2? There is a dipole. There is 2 minus, 4 plus, 2 minus. Dipoles are cancelling each other. So you don't have a net dipole. Um, what with uh, um, neon, you can create a crystal of argon, all these noble gases, which have shell completely filled, which are completely interact uh, non interactive, inactive. How do they form crystals? Well, hard. <laughs> they, they're not very happy to do it. You need to impose large pressure, low temperature, and you have to go to 80 Kelvin. 
to create argon uh, crystal and pressure and put the uh, pressure. But they still create a crystal. So they create a bond. And this is um, so called induced dust pulse. Um, use type of interaction are also known as the London dispersion what happens you have an atom of of neon which is a closed shell but then in time it's all neutral but in time actually it oscillates the charge so I'm drawing it a bit uh, with the nucleus is here you get a small fluctuation of charge um, small amount can be seen to actually oscillate and this will cause this oscillation of charge will create an electric field well first it creates a dipole okay it creates a dipole P1, I call it, um, proportional to charge times the distance over which the electrons move. Um, then this dipole creates an like electric field, which is all very small. I mean, this E is delta, something tiny, but it's not zero. And the time average is zero. Electric field is P1. <laughs> now, any atom, I know I'm scared to wipe, uh, maybe I should so it rise. So, any atom nearby will feel this field. How did they call it? Well, not much. And if you have an atom here, it will start reacting to the field by inducing its own dipole, which depends on the strength of the field. This constant here is called uh, polarizability. And then we can express the interaction. So there is a dipole P1 and the dipole P2, which will also cause in the same direction the formation uh, of the electron cloud. And the interaction between the two, P1 times P2, our what? R cubed, <coughs> is actually, one can write, um, electric field, will be P1 squared alpha R to the 6. And do you remember last time, this R6, we derived the Van der Waals and we obtained that the attractive part has 1 over R6 dependence. This is the origin. So it is an induced dipole, fluctuating dipole interaction. And this is at core of crystals which have no dipole moments. Cool. Okay, this was just the motivation why this is useful. Um, I should delete this now to let it dry. Proceed by calling this atom 1 and atom 2. This is the unit cell, A. Uh, this atom has U1 deformation, this U2. No, deformation, uh, displacement, sorry. Um, U2. Um, let's call this cell N. N plus 1 and N minus 1. So you'll have to write this time two equations because we have two atoms. 
and just like before I do it. I have to call this force constant something. So the strong one, the way I'm drawing it, I'm trying to keep the same symbol. So this is the strong one and this is the weak one, which I'm drawing as a line, almost flat, almost no interaction. And let's start for the atoms U1 in the cell N. this expression that uh, in u i minus d i j u j so we have to make a sum of all the neighbors of these uh, force constants so what do I have here um, u1 uh, atom 1, the first neighbor is atom 2 in the same cell. So it will be minus D, the spring is strong one, U2N. We are in 1D, so no vectors. Minus D, V is connecting to the N minus 1 cell. U1, N minus 1, and then there is its own D0. Um, U1, N. Here I will apply the acoustic sum rule, which says that these three have to be, uh, the sum of these three have to be, has to be 0. which says that D0 should be minus <coughs> this. Here I can choose in principle to change definition. I will go from the beginning and put a minus sign here. I can choose it because this number, I know what it is, it's given. I can just choose it to be minus to have a positive sign here. So I'm changing the sign for the strong and the weak. Okay, we're just putting a minus interaction here. I'll have a bit cleaner end result. I'm just putting, so I'm changing the sign. Okay, I can do that. And then the same um, equation, same type of equation for the mass two. Yeah, atom two are the same as in the cell N is equal in the same cell and it has a strong interaction with U1 um, with the N plus one it has a weak interaction plus one, then minus <coughs> D0, which is the same atom, um, U2, N. Okay. And let's write the expression U2, one on two, or two on N, is the amplitude one of two. Sorry, I think. Yes. I might have made a mistake. I in, in the first line, yes. uh, the U1 of N atom, uh, it, yeah, it has to be 2. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Please keep checking. <laughs> um, we want 2, uh, omega T, I, K, N, A. Here it enters the index N. Everything okay?
Well, let's find this. Now, as you noticed, we went a step before. We could have gone from the dynamical matrix directly, but we went from the first part. To kind of because we use philosopher tomorrow. If I have time, I will derive for different masses. I forgot to mention that all these molecular crystals being so weakly bound have uh, very low temperatures, so melting. Like one example is ice. I forgot to mention that also ice melts at zero Celsius or 270 Kelvin. You know that metals melt at 1000 Kelvin. Here we have 270 Kelvin. So the molecular crystals have very low melting temperatures because of the weak interactions. Ah, okay. Um, the first one. Oh, omega squared u1. <coughs> okay, I can write everything so that we can uh, cancel it. Strong spring times U2 uh, the N. Yeah, this is the N. Okay, plus the wing U2. Okay, n minus one minus now I'm not putting this zero, I'm putting this sum. D strong plus B weak times U one. Oh, what's the writing? Wish. So we can cancel all i omega t. And then we can also cancel all k and a. Here remains minus 1. And okay, let's see what we are left with. Minus n omega squared u1. nicer as u1 is a minus d strong plus d weak plus u2 d strong times the minus i a a and this equals m omega squared let change the signs everywhere omega squared u1 is it correct? first equation and then the other one we should do the same thing I will skip at least one step um, let me come to this equation for the number this is number one and the two um, 
minus m omega squared u2 if it's n times u1 um, um, the strong plus the weak here it's ka you see it's a positive one u1, no? Minus the strong plus the weak u2. <coughs> okay, and then we just uh, put in the form like the above one, u1 is strong plus the weak E I K A. Uh, let's change the sign again. Plus U2 the strong plus the weak equals M omega squared U2. This is the second equation. Is it okay? It is very simple. Just the limiting cases at zero and uh, the edge boundary, and just see how it grows, how it changes from zero. And you can solve it. Not so easy to for the whole all, all way. So, for k zero, this is the easiest case. We'll obtain the matrix. Square. 
this is a and minus a. No, it's just a minus a minus a a. One solution is zero. No. The second solution. just this type of uh, determinant a minus a minus a, a. We have to withdraw this. Hmm. It didn't distribute very well the space. got the value that we expected from before for one atom in a cell and then we got a higher value obviously not zero okay this is the first case so far all okay everyone mm -hmm. the second case Zone boundary. larger this one or this one the strong or the weak which has a higher strong one has to be larger so that we can draw them no? and we define them as positive but okay I can still write the absolute values This line, I will find um, 
lucky week somewhere higher to this strong same here well, I cannot show yet and now so we have the zero, the gamma point and the edge Let's see what happens for small k. I'll have to write here on the wet one because I'm keeping that matrix, it's still useful. So we will expand here this exponent. Is it correct? Please check. <laughs> Can you see? Sorry, but the, the, yes. the previous one for k equals 0. Yes. Uh, Gave two values here and here. Now we are just looking when it moves from 0 away. You, 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 said, you said something like. Yes. I don't know. This, you said this is a, 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 and then minus a, a, but there's a minus m omega squared here. So it can't be a. The matrix before the equalization is yeah. AA. Then you make A minus omega, A, A, A minus omega. Oh, minus, no. Then you get this. When you solve, I mean, these things some people remember by heart. Um, you don't have to, but it takes time. I also forget sometimes, I admit. So this determinant gives you A minus omega squared um, minus A squared equals zero. When you solve this, a minus omega squared equals a squared, you will get uh, 2a and uh, 0. I mean, I could just write solutions, but... Um, okay, so now in the vicinity of k0. So it's really hard to read. So let's expand that there. Um, T strong plus T weak and minus T strong plus T weak, the first term, plus I K A T weak minus K A squared the week. Please check. Okay, now we have minus this strong. No, okay, mistake. This was minus i. You think that this is plus or no? Here it's positive. No, I'm still having minus in front. So oh, okay. I'm, I hope I'm not going to write wrong. Um, yeah, strong plus the weak first term plus i. A D weak minus K A squared two D weak is strong plus two D weak. Ufa. Now, if 
you look this term and this term, and this is, um, they are complex conjugate, no? Do you agree? There is just a difference in this minus IKA and plus IKA. So I have a matrix of the type A, B, B conjugate, A. Okay? And the solutions for this one are uh, <coughs> A minus omega squared equals B squared but the absolute value. Okay. And then uh, <coughs> omega is equal A12 plus minus B. I think we had very similar thing when we were solving graphene. Um, by binding. I mean, techniques are very similar. You again, the first neighbors, <coughs> you have this uh, IKE e and the IKA. Very, very similar. Okay, I, so I just wrote here, I will copy and delete this. So we have to find the absolute value of this coefficient here. So the real part is this, this, and this. The strong plus the weak minus k a squared over two p weak squared plus k squared a squared d weak squared. Now let's factor out this part. Divided by this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can ask me also. Ah, <laughs> ah. There is really no silly question. I mean, when you see it first time, things that you know might get confused also. So don't, don't be, don't be uh, embarrassed. point I don't need this anymore. I can remove it. And now I will expand the, this uh, um, this part. K being very small. I will just take into account the mixed linear term and not take into account k in the power 4. So I'll have a factor of 2 here. Okay. 
and well, I could have written it differently. Um, yeah, I'll copy. Yeah, I'm not doing it the most efficient way, sorry. I'm, uh, um, Yeah, then one minus k square times a times d minus d This one. Yes, yeah. this one. We just took the linear term. We kept. Yes. I mean, first uh, we just uh, factor it out. We get this one divided by. And well, now I should check actually if it has any uh, anything similar to what I had before. D minus squared? Yeah, this one shouldn't be squared. This is the mistake, sorry. Because there was square here. When I factor it out, it should not be square here. So, yeah, because dimensionally it wasn't fitting. It should be the same dimension, these two guys. I was looking what's wrong. Um, okay, we can call this all a constant. It's just a combination of the force. Constant, so let's call it c square, and then we get the b. Uh, and there should be the minus sign in between uh, the last terms because we have given the minus. Minus? Is it? No. Yeah, you factorized the minus k e squared out. Ah, yeah. Right, right, right. Right. Okay, and then this is equal d strong plus d weak. We can expand the square root of a small k times 1 minus 1 half k square and this constant. Oof. Good. Now we write the omega 1 is equal to so the bar half. Here, this one. On the top, it's square root of this version. No, I expand it ah. as a uh, small k as 1 uh, minus 1 okay. half of a omega 1 is equal a and a was, uh, this was a plus this This will be then m omega squared. And then I can try to write. Um, And the mega 2 is with minus d 
this minus this and that gives just Inside this, can take oh, this yeah. K out, yeah. and also here. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm to confuse myself now. <laughs> no, yeah, actually, I just want to find how it will change. So omega will change in dependence on K, and we see that it's for very small K. Um, sorry for for the for the omega one. You are bringing the k squared out. You have to divide. Ah no, you're right. Right, no, I cannot do it. Sorry, sorry, I cannot do it. Right, okay. I don't want to do it. It's just against what they want to draw. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, this one is simpler one. It goes for k zero. It is zero. So it goes like similar to what we saw before, linearly from the gamma point. The other one, actually, for k0, it starts from this, which is, oh, I didn't put the value. It is exactly the first case. To d strong plus d weak over m. It is this value. The very first one we found for k0. This one starts from there, when k0, and then it goes down in a smoother fashion. What? Much smoother. Yeah. Okay. In principle, you can calculate the whole thing. If you want, you can use some formulas or whatever. But I'll just connect them. At this, at this point, did we assume that the D strong and D weak are both positive or negative? Um, well, it, I it should sh be using this, but from the beginning, the assumption was, was that it was positive. Okay. Okay. I mean, that's how I defined okay. for this. I think most of the case, you should write absolute values. Although here, I need to make sure that they are positive, just for you to get used to it. So here we have two dispersion relations, not one. Bringing the second atom brought a new mode of, of vibration in the, in, in the picture. Now I will need what I wrote before. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm yes. having a little trouble yes, seeing yes. Uh -huh. what what happens from omega to to omega to at k equals zero to uh, okay? It's just the it's just like the the other one. When it was just one atom. Yes. I mean, it was easier then. It was a sign. Yeah, yeah. K a half. So. Yeah, but uh, I mean, we can see here that near near k equals zero, it's, it's linear. Yes. But after that side, how do we know? It it is the same. Well, you can solve it in limits. You can solve it in limits. I will discuss now. Um, if you want the easiest way, the brute force is to solve the the for whole general. yeah general case for any k. Then you will get the two solutions. Ah, okay, you will get the, the bottom one. Sizing. We will have to sign. This one will be a bit more complicated. But actually, you can solve it. It's not something difficult. Um, but we'll come now to the limits. Um, first, I want to solve for the eigenfunctions, how they move. But for that, I would need the, the dominants I was writing before, which I don't have written anymore, <laughs> which is a bit of pain now. Um, I think I'll have to copy it because uh, I don't have it. So for k equals zero, Ah, we had a matrix 
eight minus a naught, we just talked about it. Yeah. And if you have this kind of matrix, um, times one, two, I'm now solving for u1 and u2. It has one solution when omega is zero, that u1 is equal u2. Okay, we managed to, to come to this. But with, uh, when omega is equal to a, which was the second case, this one here, then you will have minus a, minus a, in the determinant, no? You follow your what I'm saying, yeah. solving for the eigenfunctions. And uh, so this was for omega zero. Um, for omega equal to um, d strong plus d weak over n, actually you have minus a, minus a, they have to be opposite. Um, this means yes. I'm not okay. Ah, okay. This is just finding the eigenfunctions <coughs> for this case. In the case of k equals zero, we got this matrix, yeah. and it gave these two eigenvalues. When you have this, it was giving um, minus a here. You were getting minus a minus a. No. And the eigenfunctions for this, to still have a zero, no, have to be uh, opposite. You remember how to find eigenfunctions, that's kind of important, not for just this course, for, for everything. So the motion has to be opposite. Here u1 is equal to u2, here they are opposite. <laughs> and that's pi over a what was the matrix a b b a a b a in the full form, it was uh, uh, d strong plus d weak, but I don't know the signs. Anyway, anyway, a, b is fine, a, b, b, a, um, omega is a plus minus b, no? Correct? And... Um, when it's a plus b um, you get uh, minus b b, no? Correct? Please correct me. <laughs> and here, oh, I can just copy from the book. Um, so for this solution you would get u1 equal u2 And for our case, this was uh, d weak. Okay. And for the other case, omega equal a minus b, um, you will get b b b b, and you will get u one equal minus oops, minus u two. This is for the frequency as uh, strong. Okay? So we remain the same. Okay? 
So far all, all okay? All clear to everyone? Completely? Um, but you remember when we looked last time, when we took the ratio between the displacement in cell N and cell N plus 1, what we got? The same thing is going here. Displacement of N plus 1, 1 let's say, and U1 in N. You will again get this E I K M plus 1, A, E I K N A, minus 1. So, within the cell, in the acoustic, ah, okay, there is a few more things I have to say. Um, this is called acoustic mode, sound wave acoustic mode. No? Acoustic mode. This is a good chalk. Um, what are the frequencies of sound that a human ear can hear? Do you know? Okay, that's it. I don't know. I think it's between 20 hertz and 20 kilo kilohertz. The wavelength sound um, 17 roughly meters to 17 millimeters. This is the audible part. This is just, I mean, parenthesis, it's not a definition, no? but just to tell you, it's very low frequencies, 20 hertz. And then uh, the other mode can be excited by optical light, visible light. And that's what gave the name. So this gap is, I mean, this difference is usually, typically, something of the visible light uh, uh, frequency. And this is called optical mode. So we have acoustic and optical mode. Uh, acoustic mode we will have as soon as we have one atom per cell. For optical we need to have at least two because they have to move uh, opposite, out of phase. If the mass is the same, they have the same displacement but always opposite. All throughout it's opposite. Okay. Um, what else I wanted to say here? Okay, maybe I can draw uh, a few displacements for the optical and acoustic mode. In this case, so acoustic K0. atom, the small atom, the big atom, the small atom, how they move, they move all in phase. So this is the easiest case, or this or this way. Okay. Um, optical at K0, they're just moving opposite, no? zone boundary. So we have, um, this was for the zone boundary, of course. Um, we have that the atoms in the cell move together, but then the neighboring cells moving opposite. So we'll displace them here. 
on the next step is going just the opposite way. Okay, so that we, I um, mean, that both things are correct. The first one, how they move within the cell and the neighboring cells. And the um, optical at some boundary is the same logic. And now opposite here. That's it. There is really nothing difficult here. I mean, if you understood the, the very basics, it's, it's all just coming from it. Um, okay. And now let's see the limiting cases of the frequencies. In the case for the zero zone, uh, in the F S one, uh, both two molecules are vibrating in the same direction. But in the F S stick at the boundary, two molecules are vibrating in the different. How can we? Um. Then I was just deleting this. If you put the condition, if you see the displacement at the edge with the neighboring cells, this comes. They have to be opposite. They have to be opposite. But we derive here the eigenfunction, they're moving the same. So in the cell, they are in phase, but two cells are being opposite. Um, uh, so the, yes. these, um, this, this entire motion of the, of the Nucleus, no, the atoms, sorry. Ions, let's okay. call them. I mean, I call them everything. Okay. Nucleus and atoms, but they are yeah. ions. It's, it's caused by increasing the temperature. Uh, this is yes, by the non-zero temperature. Okay. Yes. Um, can be also some excitation. Can be also an excitation. They absorb a photon yeah. or something or exciton or whatever. Yeah. They are excited. Is, is there any way to find a relation between the temperature and the frequency? I mean, yes, uh, you can. Uh, it's more which which modes will be excited. Yes, you, you can you can find distribution. That's which very far from what we are excited by certain temperatures. Depends on the on how much energy you give them. You cannot excite something. Uh, this is the energy axis. Yes. The limiting cases, yes. The first limiting case um, is that D strong is much stronger than D weak. In that case, what you will get something really tiny here and almost a flat line here because the sun is actually just one term, no? This is not changing much. So, this is the limit of actually independent molecules. It's a guess on molecules. If this is very weak, so independent molecules. Um, the second limit, let's take them equal. What happens then? So, now this is the same point. I'm really drawing everything up. Okay, 
imagine that it's symmetric. But look, now we say they are the same. We ended up with the case we did last time. Same as, same spring constants, force constants. Why do we get this? The last time we got just one branch. No? You understand? Because in this limit, you're making them equal. And the masses are equal. So there is nothing to make it different one from another. So it is just the case we had last time of identical atoms, monotonic in our chain. The last time we got this sine square k half, now we're getting this. I think the top one is the contribution from the other, the smaller, the other atom. But they're the same. The brilliant zone has to be changed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Here we have one atom per cell. In this case, this is our A. We have two atoms per cell. They're identical. So this A is twice longer than that A. It means that this I have to hold, hold. So I have to just break here and fold to this now. Oh, I cannot draw it symmetrically. Never. You obtain just this thing. Everybody sees that? Um, so how many modes can you have? They depend, as we already made some kind of um, thinking about it. If you have one atom, number of atoms, number of dimensions, number of modes. One atom in one dimension, one mode. Okay? Then we put two atoms in one dimension. And we got two modes. Um, here, all our <laughs> examples are exhausted. <laughs> but if we had I'll give you a homework tomorrow. Um, okay, if we had two atoms in two dimensions, you could imagine how they could move. That you could have acoustic mode, so in X and Y. In, um, they could move um, in two directions. Acoustic mode, no? If you are in 2D, you can have them a center of mass motion in each direction. Maybe it's not easy to. Okay, maybe first. Yeah. I never have enough examples to put one atom in two dimensions. So it can move in X and Y, and it can have two center of mass motions, two acoustic modes, and that's all. Um, but if I put two atoms, it can also create different optical. Huh? So it will have four, but this uh, is not so easy anymore to, to keep uh, deducing. Um, is it like if in one dimension there is uh, Transverse and longitudinal acoustics. We will come to that, yes. And in two dimension will be two that type for acoustic, two that type yes. for... Uh, yes, yes, But it's it's hard to, I mean, you like know... this it, kind uh, of end. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, maybe I can say it here, but we haven't done that. But uh, I just have to mention it and then we'll solve a problem. Um, I'll give it tomorrow to you for Thursday that you see really how this motion can look like. Now it's not solved, but the, um, I should say first derive. Okay, let me just give the rule here because I'm afraid I will skip something important. So number of modes 
with it. I will help, I mean, it still has to be a bit more discussed on the intuitive level. Uh, is equal to number of atoms times number of dimensions. And this is maybe not clear as of now, but in a few moments I hope I will clear it out. While number of acoustic modes is equal to number of dimensions. This should be clear by now. This is determined by how many directions you have for the center of mass motion. And then the number of optical modes is equal to this minus this. And this is actually useful. When you see a photon, a phonon uh, dispersion a graph, you can count how many uh, modes it has in total. You know number of dimensions, and you can deduce number of atoms in the unit cell. You can check things like that. Um, let me check and not skip anything. Um, before we go to draw this uh, different mode. Um, in reality, what happens in a, in a crystal, it never moves with only one mode. The, I mean, it vibrates as a, as a sum of different modes. They are superposed, different motions. And the harmonic approximation tells you that actually the frequency and the amplitude in each direction is independent of all the others. That's an approximation, obviously, but it is assumption, the underlying assumption for consideration of phonons in, in this case. So you won't have just one mode, you will have a combination of modes. And let's see when you have more than one dimension. Tomorrow I'll give you a problem because I'll give you something to solve for tomorrow also, don't worry. Um, the example was like, I'll just draw the solutions because it's too much writing. Two atoms in 3D. Um, so, so, this is the cell A, B, A, B. They can move. So this is, they can move along the direction of propagation in acoustic mode, similar to what I was drawing there, but they can also move perpendicular, not we are in, in 3D. So they can also move in this direction, all together. and also in this direction. That's why three modes. Do you maybe know the name of this one when it's along the direction of propagation? Mode, way of motion. And this is called transversal. Transversal. So in the 3D we assume that each atom can only vibrate along the bond line? No, 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 you will get a combination. I mean, these are the normal modes, but in the end you will have a superposition of that. So they are moving so this, this, this in this way. So like in the surface of this, uh, how to say? They can go completely on the other. Yeah. If it depends on the, on the frequencies and amplitude in each direction. This is, I mean, you just sum the motion. And they are, okay, one and two of these, no? Because in two perpendicular directions. Um, uh, 
and the optical. Again, it can be along the direction. So. And they can be opposite. Now, this is not so easy to draw. And actually, here it depends on the masses. Mass of A doesn't have to be the same as the mass of B. And they can move differently. Just the sign has to be. Yeah. To draw this properly, it's not easy. <laughs> um, okay, this is one way, but it can doesn't have to be just this way. It can be also. Um, this is the circle. Um, so drawing. One goes up. Like this, it can be much higher. Or oh, this touch, no? They all transfer. So it can be also in X. Uh, let's say this is X, this can be Y and Z. So then you can. This is what you obtain without uh, solving. You will have three acoustic. Mm. Uh, transverse acoustic. Transverse. The L mode is always higher frequency. Always. Most, most often. And the similar thing for the optical. And actually, these two very often are the same, on the same line, completely degenerate. That's a very common thing. Or they can be along some line degenerate, and then they split in some lower symmetry case. Um, this can draw it symmetric. So this is the, the basic stuff I had to cover today. Any questions on that? What do we have on the X and Y? Uh, sorry, this is the K frequency. This is just for the case which we didn't solve now, but two atoms in 3D. You can solve it, but then you have to impose some uh, constraints on the force constants, that there are many zeros, then it's easy to solve. Because if you have like all possible uh, dx, y, dz, x in all directions, it's impossible to solve. But if you put many zeros, then, then you can come to this. I mean, you can of course draw it symmetrically. Just I'm not very able to draw anything symmetric today, so you do it. Um, any other question? What if the mass was the same? What, was, what would happen to this third one? This one? Yeah. Uh, now, it depends on the mode, but here you can know that it, they will be equally shifted. Uh, equally. Here it depends on the K, you might have a different one. But in some cases, um, yeah. if the mass is heavier, it moves less. Um, do you know any practical application of phonons? Hmm? Polarons. Polarons. <laughs> well, okay. Yes, yes. I, I meant more like a daily life. <laughs> yes, it's true. Yes. <laughs> in, in, uh, um. Like microscopy or something, maybe. Which one? Microscopy doesn't, does it? Like searching for cracks in the railways they use? Yes, okay. yes. Um, that can be used for many things. For finding oil, Yeah. then they can use, I'm um, not an expert on exactly how it's done, but they have a few of these uh, signal emitting uh, 
stations and they receive the signals from different parts and construct a picture how it uh, deflects. But this is something uh, um, there is also uh, ultrasound machines. They actually work with sound waves. They send the sound wave um, uh, to your organs, whatever, and them having different impedance, uh, they transmit differently the hormones. And then actually this can be collected back and a 3D image can be constructed even, let's say 2D image, more realistic. Any questions on, on this or anything previous? Ah, by the way, this gold thing, it's, uh, you can ask me for the color of gold. Oh, yeah. it, it is not something so simple, it's relativistic effects. It is, yeah, I was a bit, uh, I never read about it before. Um, gold is very heavy and has strong um, spin orbit coupling. And that actually distorts the orbitals and makes the, the, the bands even narrow. So, mostly metals don't have these UV strong transitions. UV, uh, UV in the ultraviolet uh, range of uh, light, which is 20 V or something. Instead, this one has. It well, has what is a UV strong transition? UV, right. ultraviolet. No, I mean the strong transition. I mean, transition. Uh, it is exactly from the, I think it was 5D yeah. to 6S. Ah, yeah, no. To yeah. 6S. Transitions by like yes. okay. And that is actually uh, absorbing strongly. It's, I think, blue light. Mm -hmm. Absorbs very strongly. It changes the reflectance. Normally, reflectance is very flat for the metals. This one has, has a gap in this part. And this is how you see the yellow light, the shiny yellow light. So it is atypical for metal. It, it is due to spin orbit. I didn't know this before, actually. But compared to so gold and other metals, copper is really light, I guess. Why do we see the same thing in copper? Um, I think a similar thing happens with, with the deflectors. But in gold itself, it's a spin orbit effect. Copper is probably just a bit... Uh, deflectors goes like... Uh, um, for, the, hmm? for the energy, it's normally mm -hmm. flat. Reflectance. Yeah. For gold, it goes like this, and copper also has a gap somewhere. Yeah. So maybe, but, e but it's not the same origin. Yeah, it in the gold, in the gold, it's it's the relativistic origin mostly. But uh, copper must have. I mean, it has also reflectance uh, yeah. uh, gap, and then it reaches. Uh, so the blue light is for for gold. I didn't notice before. <laughs> Any other questions, problems, or we solve a problem, <laughs> if you want. You want to solve the one with the find the structure and then prove that the velocity, block velocity, is parallel to the surface? I mean, few of you ask me that to, to solve uh, in person, so have you solved that one? You done it. Are you interested? I mean, I'm asking for you. Or you want to go to the next class? You tell me. Or who wants again? I mean, I won't say anything else but solve this problem. Or I can, if there is just one of you, I can solve uh, there. Tell me. I would rather go because I don't feel right a bit. Yeah. Okay. So you want to finish here? Or you want to stay? Or How do you prefer? Can you just show me the... Um, let me just see if somebody wants, wants to stay. Um, you want to stay? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. You, what do you say? I mean, I just, because exam is in two weeks, we have two more tutorials, that's it. Um, I'm just saying for that, I'm perfectly fine. Uh, I'm not testing you, I'm not grading you. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll turn off this thing. <laughs>